Hello, my name is Andrew Farnsworth. I'm a research associate at the Cornell Lab of Ornithology with a background in migration ecology and bioacoustics. And I'll be talking to you today about the challenges in identifying very short bird sounds, in particular flight calls of nocturnally migrating birds. Most bird migration occurs under the cover of darkness. Um, and the numbers are staggering. In the U.S. every year, we're talking about three to four and a half billion birds migrating annually in and out of the U.S. So it's a very large number. Now, as most of this occurs under the cover of darkness, um, we need some remote sensing methods to really uh, monitor this properly and quantify. So in our project at Cornell, BirdCast and BirdVox, um, we've looked at a couple of different methods for doing this, including using radar, which is part of the BirdCast project, and using sound, which is part of the BirdVox project, which is what I'll really be talking about today. So this diversity of species that you see here on this slide, these are all nocturnal migrants, and it so happens that they all have unique vocalizations that they use when they're migrating at night. These vocalizations of nocturnally migrating birds represent a really unique opportunity to monitor migration. And what you see here is what we call uh, the Rosetta Stone of the warblers. You'll see images of the warblers that are quite bright uh, spring plumages, breeding plumage, uh, as well as a representation above each of the pictures of the birds of a spectrogram, um, the frequency over time visualization of their flight calls, these short vocalizations that they give during nocturnal migration. Now you'll notice a number of things about these vocalizations. There are several distinct types. There's quite a lot of variation among species. Um, some very distinct, others rather similar. But now that we have these recordings, which we've gathered over the last 10 to 15 years, we can learn quite a lot about their identity. One of our primary challenges was to identify methods to automatically extract, um, detect, and classify these kinds of signals from full night audio recordings or long-term audio recordings to make the monitoring and the analyses meaningful rather than having to do it in real time with humans listening. So as part of that process, over the last 20 years, we've been working uh, quite a lot with a number of different collaborators on detection and classification methods. The initial approach, which at this point is about two decades old, really relied on transient energy, so looking at uh, distinct pulses um, separable from background noise. This was not necessarily a very um, unique or intelligent way to do things and it did not capture in terms of the precision and recall here as you can see uh, very much of the area under the curve when it came to um, actually capturing flight calls. Now more recent advances in the approach to detection including uh, shallow learning approaches for example using support vector machines those did improve the uh, metrics on how well we were doing with detection, but not significantly over the 20-year-old standard. Once we started to incorporate more advanced methods, uh, such as deep learning, uh, convolutional neural nets, um, then we started to make some major breakthroughs in terms of the detection. And as you can see, uh, increasing um, by six or seven times our area under the curve captured in this approach. Um, we've come a long way from the initial transient detector approach to detecting flight calls um, in audio signals. We realized we could advance this convolutional neural network approach even farther by augmenting our data sets in places where we did not have a significant amount of information to train. So in this case, taking a flight call and convolving it, um, altering its frequency or its duration, 
um, compressing it, adding noise. This kind of augmentation expanded our data set tremendously in terms of training uh, on the order of several orders of magnitude. And as such, once we trained models using this approach, we increased that AUC by about another 10%. The notion of accounting for uh, variation in the signal is one thing, but if we have any hope of improving the model even further, uh, we need to address another issue with the background noise, or a two-component issue, in this case, non-stationarity and non-uniformity. I'll talk about non-stationarity first. Uh, this image that you see is a spectrogram of a full night recording uh, made from Ithaca and Tompkins County during the migration season. It's about 11 hours from dusk to dawn. And even though the level of zoom is too coarse to see the individual flight calls, um, you can see how much the soundscape varies through time. So the flight calls, in this case those from uh, Viries, a uh, thrush, uh, happen in the early morning just before dawn. But all of this other information in the spectrogram from a train early on, insects, uh, automobile traffic, it all speaks to how variable the soundscape is through time. And this is, a, as we said, a particular place at a, on a particular date. And we obviously record for many dates and at many places. So this can be a significant problem. Now normalization was not the only issue here. Um, we also needed to be able to adapt because um, the non-stationarity of background noise at a particular location was just part of the equation. This background noise uh, was not uniform even across a relatively small spatial scale of tens of kilometers in Tompkins County. So figuring out a way to adapt our models, our detection approach, to this kind of non-uniform background noise was also a challenge. And the combination of non-stationarity and non-uniformity were really the primary issues that drove the failures of the initial transient detector approach. So this is a, a significant uh, effort required to deal with that problem. And we feel like we've addressed it quite well in our approach here. Hello, my name is Andrew Farnsworth. When we account for this process of normalization and adaptation, we increase our AUC even further to 76%, and we start to close in on that more ideal, in this case in white outline, um, precision recall curve. And as you can see, we've advanced tremendously far from our starting point. Um, of approximately 8% with that initial transient detector developed about 20 years ago. So from the approach of thinking about automatic detection uh, and accounting for uh, background noise, uh, non-uniformity, non-stationarity, and also variability in the signals themselves, we feel like we've come quite a long way over the last few years of this work in the BirdVox project. Hello, my name is Andrew. This work on detection was only part of the equation, so to speak. Um, we also worked on classification, and some of the work I'll speak about now comes from Jason Kramer, working uh, as a PhD at NYU under Juan Bello. And uh, he's created, with the help of our collaborators, a approach called TaxoNet that uh, basically looks at how to automatically classify uh, flight calls of, in this case, uh, 14 species of songbirds, and to do so in a hierarchical way, thinking about the hierarchy, in this case, of the taxonomy, um, their relationships, the genetic and phylogenetic relationships among these species. In uh, the figure one, um, you can see how the breakdown of um, taxonomy plays out. On the right side, under the fine classification, you have the species involved, the four-letter codes of different warblers, thrushes, and sparrows. Um, in the middle medium class, uh, you have the um, family level, if you will. And then on the left, the course class, that is the order, in this case, Passeriformes, um, the uh, primarily perching songbirds. Um, so using these approaches, 
um, Jason and and crew were able to train a model. Um, the conceptualization of it is visible in Figure Two. The Taxonet model is, uh, as we say, a hierarchical multitask model. You can see it in um, uh, represented in Panel A, uh, and we also compared it with uh, additional models. Uh, B, the flat single task, and C, a non-hierarchical approach to um, uh, classification for these songbirds. Hello, my name is Andrew Farnsworth. I'm a researcher. The results of this approach um, were quite exciting and offer uh, some paths forward, we think. So when we look at the table, uh, we see the taxonet right in the center uh, performed uh, quite well, either uh, comparably or basically the same as some of the other models, or better in the task specifically of looking at the fine grain, which you'll remember is the species level classification. Um, on the right panel, you'll see the uh, taxonet numbers represented in green for uh, comparison, a different view of what's in the table. Now, one of the primary take-homes here, of course, is that for the species level in particular, this fine grain, 66% uh, leaves a tremendous amount of room for improvement. And in the coming slides, uh, I'll talk about a few of the challenges that may be manifest in this additional, say, 30 to 40% that we'd like to improve in terms of the behavior of this model going forward in the next versions. Hello, my name is Andrew Farn. One of the fundamental challenges of monitoring flight calls at night, and so too probably representative of, of sound in general, is the notion that these sounds are occurring in a medium that varies. In particular, uh, the atmosphere, where temperature and humidity, for example, may vary, as uh, may well the distance of the signaler to the microphone. So in this case, um, looking at work that Kyle Horton and colleagues uh, published in 2014, we see an example flight call of a black and white warbler. And in the left panel, we look from top left to bottom right um, at that call as it changes in altitude for a fixed um, temperature of 20 degrees Celsius and 50% relative humidity with the percent decibel decrease in that signal represented by percentage um, above the x-axis, the right side of each x-axis. So as you can see, think of the intensity that you can see on this spectrogram as if representing the most information in the upper left and the least in the bottom right of that figure three uh, left-hand panel. If we look again at this in uh, a little um, further detail at a particular altitude, for example, uh, 150 meters represented by the red box, the change in relative humidity and change in temperature at a single altitude also dramatically affects the properties of the flight call. So extracting any sort of information from a detection and classification approach may have a significant challenge here because of this. Some acoustic environments may be complex and this is one example, despite the signals themselves being very simple, that's a representative of what this complexity might mean in terms of a challenge. Overlapping signals are what I'm talking about. And in this case, we see three warblers, American Red Star, Northern Parilla, and Common Yellowthroat, and their flight calls represented in this snippet of a recording from the September 11th Memorial in Southern Manhattan. You can see in this case that large numbers of flight calls in the very bright oranges and reds in the spectrogram are visible and are overlapping, such that identifying each of these different species, even for an expert, may be challenging. So this is one situation where additional information and additional training is absolutely going to be necessary. 
Hello, my name is Andrew Farnsworth. I'm a research associate at the... The final challenge uh, comes from similar species. Um, from the human perspective, this group of four warblers uh, sounds incredibly similar. Field identification uh, may be impossible in most uh, situations. And figuring out how to properly identify these birds uh, presumably will be some combination of the human listening and reviewing digitally, uh, visually, etc., um, in conjunction with various machine learning and probably sound analysis approaches to teasing apart perhaps aspects of these signals that humans can't identify and can't necessarily perceive until shown what's available. Hello, my name is Andrew Farnsworth. I'm a research associate. The work that I've discussed today uh, was funded by a number of sources from uh, diverse institutions and also represents the work of quite a large number of people. I'd like to thank all of them and acknowledge them in this slide. And I'd also like to thank all of you for listening today and if you have any follow-up questions, feel free please to email me at af27 at cornell.edu. Thank you.